Well, greetings, everyone. Again, I'd like to thank Samantha for asking me to speak this evening. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to present some of the archaeological work that I and my colleagues completed along the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Railroad when I was working at the Harry Reid Center across the street from the Desert Research Institute, where I am now, uh, 20 years ago. It's hard to imagine how fast time flies uh, looking back on some of these projects. Um, the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Railroad was the first railroad built through Las Vegas, and it would eventually become part of the Union Pacific Network and is still the major railroad line that's passing through Southern Nevada. Tonight, I'm gonna to begin with a brief history of the construction of the line and then talk about the camps and the men that built the route. Afterwards, I'll present some of the historical, historical archeological findings that we encountered while documenting a baker's dozen worth of construction camps uh, for various projects uh, in the Northern and Southern parts of the Valley. Uh, the scope of these projects always requires a team and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge two other archeologists who've made this presentation possible. Um, quite a few of us worked on those projects, but in particular, one is Dave Smee. He's not only a solid field archeologist, but a talented artist. And so he did all of the, uh, the detailed illustrations that I'll be using in the presentation. And then the other is Bill White. Bill was our principal archeologist at the time and was the lead author on most of the technical reports that followed. And uh, to start off, in fact, I'm just gonna steal straight from Bill and uh, borrow his prose for the next three paragraphs uh, to launch our introduction to the railroad. Steam locomotion was paramount to Western American expansion. Often captured in color, colorful prose, sepia pictures, and classroom, classic Western movies. Prior to 1903, the Las Vegas Valley was largely unoccupied by Euro American settlers. Prospectors roamed the desert wilds in search of mineral wealth, and mining settlements occurred sporadically on the stark landscape in southern Nevada and California. Dependent upon imported supplies, particularly fresh produce, the bounteous Las Vegas Rancho, and several other smaller farms and ranches in the Las Vegas Valley supplied the local mining communities by a network of wagon roads and trails that crisscrossed the valley and extended into the hinterlands. What was present in the valley was water and a steady permanent supply of it. As seen in this early photograph, the Las Vegas Creek flowed across the Las Vegas Ranch and a permanent water source and supply eventually caught the eyes of those contemplating steam rail travel through the desert. More than any single causal factor, Las Vegas Creek and the coming of the railroad were the genesis of change in Southern Nevada. Although gambling and tourism would drive later expansion of the town into a modern metropolis, the city of Las Vegas owes its creation of the railroad that would become the Southwest leg of the Union Pacific. As I mentioned, this presentation focuses on the camps associated with the initial years of construction of the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake Railroad in Nevada. And construction occurred between 1903 and 1905. By 1921, uh, the Union Pacific Railroad system had absorbed the San Pedro, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake commonly referred to as the Salt Lake route, running from Salt Lake to Los Angeles with its distinctive Arrowhead logo. The following will be just the brief history of the prominent players and politics involved in the construction of one of the last major railroads to thread its way across the landscape in the American West. Envisioning the potential advantages of constructing a more direct all weather route between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles, self-made businessman, and I envy the facial hair. And US Senator William A. Clark from Montana actively promoted rail connection in the 1890s. The proposed project, however, was initially embroiled in conflict and legal disputes over rights of ways held jointly by the Union Pacific and the Oregon Short Line in Utah and Southeastern Nevada. Despite the legal wrangling and posturing, 
Clark moved forward with the formation of the SPLA and SL in 1901 and began construction of the line in the San Pedro and Los Angeles areas by incorporating several existing railroad lines and absorbing their trackage. In 1902, differences were settled and a compromise was reached between Clark and E. Harriman, the Union Pacific president, whereby each would share half interest in the venture. At the eastern end in Utah, initial construction was limited to improving existing railroad alignments. There was, and here I'm gonna quote Bill directly again, uh, there was, however, a 302 mile wide gap across the harsh, vast desert landscapes of Southern Nevada and California, where a ribbon of steel would be laid uniting the two cities. What did I tell you? Bill's writing was mighty fine on those technical reports. Survey parties under the supervision of F.M. Robinson had been wandering the desert since the Harriman and Clark agreements. There they laid out the most acceptable route and had returned to Los Angeles in July 1903 with their maps and calculations. During that same month, the Empire Construction Company, a subsidiary of the new railroad, issued a request for construction bids of the first 100 plus miles. 15 contractors, including the Kilpatrick Brothers and Collins, W.C. Bradbury and Company, and the Utah Construction Company owned by the Wattis brothers traveled along the proposed route preparing calculations and notes. By August, the SPLA and SL awarded a contract to Norton and Long, a Los Angeles based firm, to complete 55 miles of railroad grade starting from Daggett, California, working east and northeast towards Nevada a contract for 85 miles of railroad grade south and southeast of Caliente was awarded to the Utah Construction Company, thereby securing, quote, one of the biggest railroad con contracts that have been let in the West in recent years, unquote, as reported in the Salt Lake Tribune on August 10th, 1903. A Utah Construction Company camp was established in the vicinity of Caliente and William Wattis began loading men, machinery and supplies for shipment to the construction front. Edmund Wattis departed Ogden to handle UCC operations at the Nevada location. It was expected that within the week uh, and once work was fully underway that 2,500 men and 500 horse teams would be employed. Additional equipment shipped to Caliente by the Utah Construction Company included a great number of steam shovels, scrapers, teams, camp wagons, etc. The Utah Construction Company also purchased 60 cars of rails and wooden ties from the Kilpatrick brothers to be used in the work. By September of 1903, 75 carloads of all kinds of material and supplies had been received in a single week in Caliente. Once started, work advanced quickly and with purpose to establish the grade and preparation of track laying. 200 men working under the supervision of the Corey brothers completed 12 miles of grade in the vicinity of the pockets within the volcanic walled canyon of the Meadow Valley, or Meadow Valley Wash. In November, the Utah Construction Company was utilizing up to 1,200 horse and mule teams and 1,200 ethnically diverse men to grade along the construction route. The Lincoln County Recorder reported that Caliente's genial postmaster was seriously contemplating, quote, taking a course of study in Greek, Austrian, Italian, and Finland so as to be able to decipher the massive letters that were arriving at his office. Also in November, as the pace of construction quickened, George Mensch added his two carloads of horses and four carloads of implements, along with a crew of laborers, the construction force under subcontract to the Utah Construction Company. As the Nevada front advanced, so too did the private entrepreneurs catering to the indulgent needs of the workers. As it was noted in the Lincoln County record that, quote, several saloons moved down the line this week and the saloon stores and boarding houses kept pace with the graders. 
Here's one of those uh, store tents, uh, a sutler following the construction crews. Uh, what the construction uh, subcontractors weren't su supplying to the, the workers, uh, they surely could go spend their earnings once they hit payday with one of the sutlers or the uh, mobile saloon keepers that were following along behind them. Track laying crews followed the grading crews, often at a rate of 7,000 feet a day with the aid of a Harris track laying machine. By February 1904, track laying gangs had completed 40 miles of rails below Caliente and 13 bridge carpenters were laid off as all the bridge work had been completed to Moapa. The Taylor brothers and their laborers had finished their Utah construction company subcontract in the vicinity of Moapa and were pulling out to go back to Ogden where they planned to recuperate until the following spring. Because they completed the first 85 miles of grade construction ahead of the contracted completion date in July of 1904, the Utah Construction Company was awarded a contract for the next stretch of land. William Wattis immediately sent messages to those grading outfits who had completed their sections to prepare to be moved forward to initiate new work. It was anticipated that that work covering about 50 miles beyond Moapa would involve several rock cuts requiring the removal of 35,000 to 75,000 yards of solid rock. With the movement of approximately 1.5 million cubic yards of material for the entire stretch. By March 1904, work on the overall grade was progressing from four work fronts. From Caliente, Moapa area south, from Daggett, California north, and both north and south from a point near the California and Nevada state line. The present location of the Idaho Paw siding is generally where that work was centered. Construction trains carrying passengers and supplies were running nightly between Caliente and Moapa, with most of the grading completed to the Las Vegas ranch in May. Little stood in the way of completing the railroad grade across the relatively level floor once they hit the Las Vegas Valley. Track laying reached the vicinity of the Las Vegas Ranch in mid-October as grading crews continued pushing south towards the Nevada-California state line. By mid-November, steel track had been laid 20 miles south of Las Vegas, and grading outfits such as the Dunley Brothers were packing up and shipping out. <coughs> Excuse me. The Searchlight newspaper reported in early January 1905 that only a seven and a half mile gap separated the south and northbound track layers between sightings number 31 and number 33. By the middle of January, only four miles remained. Quote from the paper, night and day the work goes on with from 1,000 to 1,500 men on the job, whereby from 10 to 20 feet of solid rock is being removed and the sounds of the blast shots can be heard for 30 miles. In the vicinity of the number one siding, which would become the Souter siding, the remaining gap between Los Angeles and Salt Lake was closed, and the last rail was secured by, as the newspapers described, a burly Greek laborer driving the last spike at 3.15 in the afternoon of January 30th, 1905. At seven o'clock on the brisk morning of February 9th, 1905, a special two-car train comprised of Railroad Vice President J. Ross Clark's business car number 101 and General Manager R. E. Wells's car number 100 pulled out of the Salt Lake City Station. It was bound for the Pacific Coast, being the first through train on the new route to carry passengers. Rather than trying to set any record for travel between Salt Lake and Los Angeles, the purpose of this first special train was officially an inspection and for uh, any further direction of the work along the route. It wouldn't be until April 15th before the SPLA and SL initiated passenger service with the intention of collecting revenue. 
To mark the occasion, a train of palatial splendor was prepared to transport a delegation of the Utah Woodmen destined for a convention in Los Angeles. The train consisted of 12 cars pulled by steam locomotive number 406 with its new pile electric headlamp to light the way. As I mentioned uh, prior to moving back over here to Desert Research Institute, I spent 15 years at the Harry Reid Center for Environmental Studies across the street at UNLV. And while there, we initiated and completed the investigation of more than a dozen historic archeological sites between 1997 and 2001. All of the archeological sites uh, in those particular projects, which paralleled the railroad grade, were found to be associated either directly or indirectly to the construction of the San Pedro, Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad. The sites directly associated with railroad construction are grading camps. Sites related indirectly with railroad construction include Teamster encampments, a butcher's enterprise, and a private liquor merchant's camp. Again, saloons and uh, other settlers were following the men as they worked. Archaeological work conducted at the sites variously included surface inventory and documentation of site features and artifacts, archaeological surface scraping and excavation of selected features, artifact recovery, analysis, and curation, and archival research and presentation of the findings in our standard cultural resources reports. Based on observations at the study sites, some generalizations regarding the Salt Lake Route construction camps near Las Vegas can be made. Construction-related grading camps are found in close proximity to the railroad grade itself and are relatively large in size and the number of features present and connect to other camps by at least one wagon road. Grading camp features typically include a blacksmith activity area, horse picket lines, numerous tent pads used primarily as residences, but at least one large dining tent is typically present, one or two dugouts used for food storage, or other materials, domed rock ovens for bread baking, and multiple fire hearths. Water was supplied to the grading camps by either wagon load or by a pipeline, with the water being stored in concrete lined cisterns. An occasional wagon loading ramp or platform may also be present. Trash dumps may be found in close proximity to the dining tents, but more likely were deposited on the periphery of the camps. Support camps or entrepreneurial camps are typically smaller in size and consist of fewer features. Such camps can be found immediately adjacent to, between, or nearby the larger grading camps, but also always connected by a wagon road. The types of support or entrepreneurial camps identified by the Harry Reid Center were occupied by whiskey merchants, butchers, and teamsters. Types of features found and the camps vary depending on the function of the camp. For example, a Teamsters camp included a dining tent, a blacksmith, a corral area, a loading ramp or platform, and a few tent pads for the camp's residents. An independent whiskey merchant's operation was a single tent pad along the wagon road between camps, and the artifact assemblage was dominated by beverage class artifacts such as bottles and bottle caps. A butcher's camp contained a few tent pads for habitats, a corral area for the livestock, and a large ash and bone dump resulting from the processing activities. Within our hour this evening, I have chosen one archaeological site, 26CK5679, to focus on. I will discuss some of the features and artifacts we identified during the data recovery, and then paint for you a picture and I'm throwing a pun out early, uh, of what the camp looked like in 1905. Here's an overview of the archeological site. Still rolling a, over a century later, a couple of HRC archeologists 
Uh, that's Wendy Andrew Jack Bertling on the left and Bill White, who I mentioned at the beginning, standing there on the right with the measuring tape. Uh, here they pause to watch a passing train while we're recording the features at the camp. After what's now 120 years, the course of the Salt Lake route is still an active wet railway, just as it was in 1905. And here is a map showing the um, camp. The railroad grade is the gray bar at the top. The red lines are the wagon roads passing through. There are two parallel gray oblong features, um, which are the horse picket areas. Most of the green squares are tent pads. There's one blue square, which is the cistern, and a magenta colored square, which was a dugout. And then some little red boxes, which are either rock ovens or uh, fire hearts. First, I'll talk about the water cistern, which was the first feature we recorded um, when we got to the site. Uh, this water storage structure was dug into an embankment at the western edge of the drainage. Uh, the drainage is and the top part portion of the photo were standing on the high ground. Uh, the caliche layer that was exposed at the surface was broken through and then used as building blocks to line the top of the earthen berm, forming the basin sides. Uh, concrete was then employed to line the basin and was often less than one inch thick where it was poured on the interior. This thin pour, uh, which was probably hand done, uh, contributed to the acceleration, accelerated deterioration of the feature and why it looks the way it does in the photos. A breach formed near the cistern's northeast corner and may have been the result of the drain pipe being removed when the camp was abandoned. At the top of the concrete lining, the cistern measures 16 feet square and it's eight feet square at the bottom with slanted sides and is four and a half feet deep. Uh, the wagon road uh, through this camp passes near the edge of the tank and water was probably delivered to it by wagon load from Venderville. Uh, Venderville was uh, another site of the time period uh, that a lot of the freighters used as a camp in addition to some of the sutlers who were selling stuff to the construction crews and from the vicinity of the Kyle Ranch in North Las Vegas they actually ran uh, a pipeline with several pumps to pump it up the grade up to the apex area where this particular camp is um, in order to get water up that far. And from there, they would load it into barrels, uh, load the water into barrels on wagons, and then take the wagon loads of water barrels to the individual camps over where the actual railroad construction was taking place. During the occupation of this camp, the cistern would have had a maximum capacity of holding over 5,000 gallons of water uh, for you know, a bunch of thirsty railroad construction guys. Uh, talk about some low visible archeology. span um, If you look in the center of the photograph, uh, you can see some slight disturbance patterns in the gravels. Uh, numerous tent pads were recorded at this site, and they were identified by the slight earthen berms placed around the pad perimeters, probably where the guys were using the desert pavement, the rocks from the desert pavement, to hold down the edges of their tents. Uh, we've experienced uh, a windy springtime. These guys would have been dealing with the same issues. Um, and so that would just be one more way they could help secure it in addition to all the guy wires and stuff they would normally use on their campus tents. Um, in addition to the patterns in the pavement, we would also find some of those guy wires and tent stakes uh, at or near the corners of most of the pads. Uh, concentration, oh, and here's a photo back uh, to the survey crews as they're trying to set up camp and you can see the guys in the middle uh, are holding onto their hats and also trying to hold on to one of the tents 
um, as things are, are blowing around out there. So weather would have been uh, something to contend with in addition to just the pace of construction. And here are some of the personal items found in association with the tent pads at the camps, uh, buttons and suspender buckles, uh, boot harnesses, the corner from a picture frame. There's the uh, snap closure uh, from the upper portion of a coin purse. Uh, there was one firearm projectile that probably was of the period, uh, an inkwell and uh, old timer brand pocket knife. Um, just a few of the things that escaped someone's pockets uh, or other personal items while they were at that particular camp. Uh, larger than any of the other tent pads, what we called feature 18 probably functioned as the camp's main dining tent and the cook shack. Uh, this particular tent pad uh, measured 15 feet wide and was 46 feet long and was generally defined by a low earthen berm, much like many of the others. Uh, this was particularly defined in the northeast corner. Uh, when we were doing the recording out here, uh, one of the things we would do was measure the dimensions of the tent pads uh, to the best of our ability based on the disturbance patterns, both to make a drawing uh, to include in the report, but also to take back uh, to the lab to go through reproductions of the old Sears and Roebuck catalogs because those catalogs typically had a section where you could order such uh, canvas tents and there would be a chart listing the size of the tent dimensions um, and with the pricing for each of the individual size tents. And we could match our dimensions that we measured in the field up to that chart to figure out what the nearest size canvas tent would have been and probably would have been the candidate for that particular tent pad. Uh, at the dining tent, also coal fragments and slag were present at the pad's eastern end, suggesting that meal preparation and cooking occurred there. Again, cooking stoves were another thing that you could have ordered from the period out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And the examples shown in those catalogs probably would have been similar to what they were using out here at the, the construction camps. Uh, in the photo is a large concentration of empty food cans that was just to the northeast of the pad. And uh, there were also several eating utensils, including uh, a complete fork, uh, a small tin drinking cup, and uh, the, the front half, uh, the metal portion of what would have been a wooden handled spoon. Again, further. Um, Further evidence for our interpretation of this particular pad was used as the dining tent. Uh, dome rocked ovens were pretty prominent uh, for all the construction camps that, that we worked on. Again, we were working at the, the north and south end of the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, so all of our construction crews uh, would have been coming down from Salt Lake City and as I mentioned in the historic introduction um, from that postmaster's quote in Caliente, um, there were a lot of Mediterranean uh, laborers uh, involved with these construction crews in particular. If you go back into the newspapers at the time, uh, there was an influx of uh, Mediterranean immigrants headed to Salt Lake City to be new members of the uh, church. And they then got picked up uh, relatively easy for this manual labor uh, to, to earn some money for their families and so join the construction crews. And uh, at this particular site, we found two of these ovens. Uh, it was constructed initially by digging into the west bank of a drainage. Limestone and caliche blocks were then dry stacked on an earthen shelf to form the walls of the chamber. While the side and back walls fashioned a semicircle, the front was straight with the end result being a D-shaped oven when you looked at it downward in plan view. Uh, widely spaced slabs of limestone that were found 
that were relatively flat were laid as the floor, and the gaps between were then fire hardened earth. Uh, charcoal removed from the oven chamber during the heating process was tossed to the left of the left of the oven's entrance. Uh, we did a shovel scrape outside and found the charcoal standing. And on this particular example, the top has collapsed inward and it's currently filled with um, the collapsed top of the dome, uh, the earth that was thrown on top of it and a pack rat midden, uh, the pack rat had moved in. Uh, so that last view was up on the slope, looking down on it. Here's a view from the opposite direction after we excavated it. Uh, the lentil rock uh, over the opening was still in place. So we worked at it from the top, uh, from the back, uh, removing that collapsed dome portion and then cleaning it out. You can see the flat packed uh, earth and limestone floor inside through that opening and that ash stain uh, from where they were tossing the, the, the coals and ashes out after they were done using it. Um, most of these match Mediterranean style bread ovens seen in the ethnographic literature um, for long periods of time prior to 1905 and are probably uh, individual uh, Greek or Italian laborers who were buying additional flour um, or, or other supplies from the sutlers and doing some additional bread baking and other roasting um, in addition to what the camp cooks were preparing for them. There was a dugout um, at the camp, which functioned as a storage facility, most likely. Uh, both the uh, supplies for food preparation and, uh, and consumption at the dining tent, which was just behind where the photographer is standing. Uh, the dugout was constructed by digging into the hillside. You can see the uh, carbonate stained soil that's been tossed out on the other side of the hole. Uh, again, like the um, uh, water cistern, blocks of caliche taken from the pit were also used as building blocks to help kind of line and act as retaining walls uh, inside the structure. Um, this one was seven feet wide by 12 feet long. And here is uh, during excavation shot in the front half. Again, we've turned direction and are now standing inside of it. Uh, here you can see some of the caliche blocks still in place forming the entrance and it was found that this dugout was accessed by a short ramp that terminated in a shallow step down onto a floor of compacted and slightly discolored soil. Uh, two wooden stakes um, at the corner of the step may have supported a wood plank that was intended as the final step down into the room. Uh, a third post remnant was used to support a wooden shelf along the east wall. Uh, here's the collapsed shelf now lying in the middle of the room. Um, this was a, a 32 inch long board at one point uh, that still had a couple of cans and stuff sitting on top of it. And there was the remains of a wooden board with a leather strap hinge uh, found above the floor at the entrance, and this may have been part of the dugout wooden door that was put together from scrap wood around the camp. Uh, this hinge in particular uh, was made from a piece of harness leather, and in addition to the nails used to secure it to the board, it still has one of its brass rivets uh, from when it was used as a harness. Uh, separated from the rest of the camp by distance and out of view. Um, let's just jump back a couple photos real quick. Um, this little hill that the dugout is dug into, if you walked around it to the right, we found another tent pad. And that tent pad, um, again, separated by distance and view, uh, and was located in a drainage at the southwest corner of the camp but was along the main wagon road and where it started to branch to some of the adjoining camps. Uh, this was one of the saloon vendors 
um, set up out of sight um, from the main camp, but I'm sure all the guys in camp knew right where he was. Uh, the pad here was uh, 14 feet wide by 22 feet long. So not only could the uh, owner uh, been able to sleep in there and store his supply, but there was probably room to set up a, a table and some benches. Uh, around the tent pad, we found broken beer bottle glass, an assorted bottle closure hardware. Uh, the only place in the camp where we found it was at this particular pad. Uh, due to its relatively isolated location and the presence of the beer bottles, including this um, wire closure. Uh, so this bottle neck uh, would have been a, a large beer bottle that had a cork. And then this metal cap with the wire closure would secure around the neck. Uh, this one is stamped Salt Lake Brewing Company. So no doubt, uh, again, that these crews are um, the ones coming down from Salt Lake City working towards Las Vegas. Uh, this pad was also separated um, uh, on the east slope of a hill, uh, a little further away from the main camp um, and was to the west of the main camp. And we interpreted this as a blacksmith's activity area. Uh, it was a 12 foot square pad. They cut a terrace. Um, you can see where the creosote bush is. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a mound there with a flat spot just beyond it. Um, and the, the material scraped from the flat spot was then deposited to create that downslope terrace. Uh, one of the wagon road branches goes right up to this pad. Um, we did two surface scrapes. Uh, basically, rather than digging an excavation unit, we would use a flat shovel to take off the first inch or two and pass it through a screen. Uh, in addition to coal and slag uh, being present in the south, southern corner of the pad, um, those shovel scrapes yielded cut flat and bar stock metal, horseshoe nails, cut and resharpened chisel bits and other forged debris. And then the last major um, feature that we recorded or type of feature that we recorded was picket lines. Um, so this is one of two equestrian picket lines we recorded It's on a gentle slope oriented uh, northeast to southwest. The two larger bushes in the foreground are on a berm of gravel and you can see there's slight uh, areas on either side where that gravel has been scraped away or trampled on. Uh, it would have been two rows of horses head to head uh, with a picket line, a picket rope strung down the middle along that gravel berm. Uh, this feature was 90 feet long. Uh, those disturbances on either side are about six feet wide. That center island is about three feet wide. And we did some shovel scrapes uh, in this area in those um, disturbed areas between the gravels. Um, and we found a buried layer of fibrous organic material, um, or to eliminate the scientific jargon, there was a, a bunch of old horse manure. Um, and artifacts that were on the surface around this feature included uh, hay baling wire, harness rings, and horseshoe nails. So back to the map I showed earlier. Um, as I said in my introduction, I would try and paint you a picture of what the site looked like. Um, beyond just the, the photos uh, and this map, and here's what that painted picture is. As I mentioned, Dave Smee not only was a great archeologist to work with, but also a professionally trained artist. And so, uh, one of the great pleasures of my career when I was working with Dave is on the last day of a project, uh, we would all stand around and talk about what we found, what we saw, um, what 
uh, features we, we all worked on and what we thought the activities were going on at any particular site. And then Dave would take some overview photos and he would create a watercolor painting. And so here in the upper left, they're actually working on the railroad grade and you've got the grading crews uh, with uh, Fresno scrapers and horse teams out in front of the track laying Harris machine. You've got various um, tents in the background for uh, the workers to sleep at along with the two domed rock ovens puffing away in the wash. Uh, there's a wagon full of barrels delivering water to the water cistern, the long dining tent uh, and some of its uh, diners are in the center of the photo with the dugout off to the right. Um, there was one loan, and I forgot to mention this in the presentation and I'm looking at it now in the painting, there was one lone tent up on the hill above the dugout, which we thought might have been the foreman's tent. So he sort of had the, the grand view of his whole um, operation going on. And the lower right around the corner of the hill uh, is the whiskey vendor uh, with his wares. And then in the left corner is uh, the blacksmith and instead of a full tent, we have him set up with a shade cover uh, with his tools and a, a rack with some horseshoes. And if I were to go back again today, the only change that I would make on Dave's painting is um, without even thinking about it, uh, we put in a rock constructed uh, forge. And he probably would have had a, a pressed metal portable forge ordered out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog, uh, which would have been easy to just load onto a wagon to take to the next camp. And it wouldn't require deconstructing or reconstructing uh, an actual stone uh, forge. Uh, but otherwise, uh, this is the interpretation that we came up with uh, based on the work that we did um, there at those or that particular construction camp. And one of the things that was uh, disappointing in our research at the time was we found those couple of photos of the survey crews, but we never found a photo of the construction crews. And about 10 years after we did this project, uh, while looking at UNLV special collections for something completely different, I bumped into one of those photos. And as an archaeologist, you know, more than just the arrowheads and the tin cans and everything, what, what we're really after is the story. And we always hope that the story that we tell is close to what the story was. And so if you take a second to absorb the painting that Dave did based on our interpretation of our work, here is that photo. Uh, this was actually a couple of years after the railroad was constructed. They had a big flood through Meadow Valley wash and they sent some of those same construction crews back down from Salt Lake to do the repairs. And that is the historic photo. And it's a pretty good dead ringer. There's the horse. Uh, it looks like they're not all quite tied in a picket line, but they're in one general area probably along a feed line. In the middle of the camp is one long main tent, which is probably the dining tent. There are the other tents surrounding for the sleeping quarters. And there in the background is the railroad grade uh, with a couple guys standing on it and a big uh, cut that they made with uh, the debris off to the left-hand side. So, you know, for finding it eight or 10 years after the work was done, we felt pretty fulfilled that we told a, a pretty good story. Um, since we still have some time, um, I'm gonna go into one particular artifact class um, that we kind of had some fun with uh, and kind of focus in on that for a few minutes. And that is the uh, five pound Santa Cruz blasting powder can. Uh, most of the ones that we found were embossed Santa Cruz brand. Um, Hercules, also another popular uh, brand of the time. 
well, they must have got a good contract deal with Santa Cruz. Um, and we found these cans everywhere. Um, most of the, the camps that we did were up at the north end of the valley in the apex area or down south of Sloan um, in the areas where there are some hills and some major washes. So there was a lot of cut and fill work and a lot of blasting going on. And rather than just abandoning these cans at the areas where they were doing the blasting, it looks like the guys would pack the powder and then tote the cans back to camp to use for all sorts of um, various and a sundry needs, uh, sort of functioning as a Swiss army can, if you will. Um, we found them uh, used as architectural elements throughout the camps, uh, used as furniture, used in food preparation, uh, there were domestic uses, and then there were a few that we could tell were modified, but just weren't sure of exactly what function it was that they were trying to use them for. Uh, in terms of the architectural elements, again, the photo of the guys trying to put the canvas tents up in the wind. Um, they were used as tent tie down weights. Uh, in some instances, the cans were just filled with sand and left on the surface. And other times they were filled with sand and buried like an anchor, uh, typically using some of the leftover baling wire, I'm sure from over with the horse feed uh, to create even stronger guy wires than just rope. And then uh, at some of the dugouts, uh, if they didn't have the caliche block available in the deposits at that camp, uh, then they would fill, again, fill the cans with sand and use them as retainers in the dugouts. And so here's one of the uh, tent weights. Uh, just to the left end of the scale, there is a piece of bailing wire that's been punched through the corner, uh, used to tie it off to the nearby tent. In this case, this one was left on the surface. It wasn't one of the ones buried like an anchor, but in a couple of areas uh, where we found just the wire sticking up in a corner, we actually did a couple of small excavations to see if they were stakes or whatever they were using. And typically we would end up finding one of these buried cans. And here's a dugout at one of the other camps. Um, so uh, there wasn't a caliche shelf uh, along the drainage. This was in a, a, a flat area on top of a ridge. And so here the blasting powder cans were used uh, as a retaining wall at the upper edge of the, the dugout. And then over time, they've fallen into the middle. And this is that dugout uh, with the partial um, retaining wall still in place on one side after we got done um, doing some test excavations in it. Uh, part of the surprise was furniture. I mean, these are fairly good sized cans. So using them, you know, think of a, a paint bucket today uh, for those archeologists watching, you know, it's really easy to flip one of those upside down to make your makeshift stool when you're doing field work. Uh, but in addition to, to chairs and stools, they were also used to make tables or be used with uh, boards to be table legs. Uh, and also surprisingly sleeping platforms. Uh, that was one that was not apparent at first. Uh, this is one of them. It had been up on the ridge. Uh, strong winds over time uh, pushed the cans and a giant bundle uh, off into the wash. And at first I had looked at this and just thought, well, they're using bailing wire to tie these things together. Uh, so they could just pick up a whole group of them and throw them in a wagon and then also just push them off as a group when they get back to the camp. Uh, but Dave uh, really wanted to play with it and um, started unrolling the ball and found out there was a pattern to the way they were tied together. And as you can see, a joining can is a joint to, uh, tied to a joining can uh, in this photo. And when he got it unrolled, uh, it turned out to be this long uh, platform. And it was just about lunchtime. And Dave took advantage of it 
and said that it wasn't too bad. And if he had a hay stuff mattress, it probably would have been just about perfect. And in addition to that single sleeper, it looks like we either had a, a large guy like myself uh, or a couple of guys went at it together uh, to, to make a, a larger sleeping platform that probably could have slept two or three guys. Uh, structural elements uh, of the Haars and the Dombrock ovens, uh, they were used as wall retainers, um, both unmodified or filled with sand. They were used as reflectors. One of the things I like to remind school kids when I go give talks is these rusty cans were shiny cans when they were in use. Um, so they would have reflected a flame pretty well. Um, and then they were used as uh, oven access covers on some of those dome rock ovens. Uh, here's a, a hearth. Uh, there's a loose can in the middle, but you can sort of see that horseshoe shape uh, group of half buried cans uh, when we excavated that one, oop, I guess I don't have an excavation or post excavation shot. Uh, but when we excavated that one, uh, there was charcoal standing in the center. Um, and then the, the um, cans, you could tell, had been buried in place to form that particular individual oven. Um, guys would have used these if it was one of the camps occupied in the winter months. Um, or sometimes, you know, not in the middle of the summer, but at either end of the season, evenings can still get cool. Um, also would have provided some light if it was a moonless night. Uh, but if they were making coffee or other beverages, um, it would have also aided in that preparation. In addition, again, uh, to what they were getting supplied by the, uh, the construction camp, uh, at the dining tent, they would have also been able to get their own supplies uh, from the settlers. And here is a rock stacked, um, uh, uh, not an oven, but a hearth. Um, and as you can see, as we excavated uh, to get to the bottom of it, because it had infilled over time, um, at what would have been the ground surface, there's some charcoal staining. You can see some grayer staining where the trowel is which would have been the original surface of the soil. And there's an unrolled can that's used in the back as a reflector in this particular hearth. And here's a Donebrock oven at one of the other camps. Again, you see the long lintel rock on the top. We've um, uh, reached in and cleaned out the pack rat nest and stuff that had accumulated inside. Uh, but on the top, uh, they had used uh, an unrolled uh, blasting powder can to provide an access cover so that once you got done heating up the bread or whatever was in there, not only could you pull it out through the little opening in the front, but you could also reach in from the top. Or if you needed to add more wood or fuel, um, you could do that through that top hatch as well. Um, kind of expanding on that, in actual food preparation. Uh, we found grills that were used on top of some of those uh, hearths uh, and, and cook stoves made directly from the cans and some bread loaf pans near one of the ovens. And so here's a small uh, fire hearth uh, just cut into the edge of the wash bank. Uh, and in this case, there's a flattened blasting powder can that's had a rectangular hole cut in the top. Uh, to allow you to set a pot or coffee pot or uh, whatever your requirement was for your cooking that day um, to be done on a, a more stable platform than trying to balance it just simply on the coals and also could provide that indirect heat you sometimes need rather than placing it directly on the coals. And here's a two burner uh, grill top. This one was found loose, but in the general area of one of the, the hearths. Um, some of us who were Boy Scouts made coffee can stoves as one of our skills we learned. Uh, and this is the same concept. So the front has been cut, cut open and folded down so you could put 
uh, your fuel in there, whether it's already prepared coals from a bigger campfire that you're shoveling in, or you're using small fuel to create uh, coals inside this. And then it's got a small opening to act as a burner. And uh, the, the diameter on these cans and that hole uh, would be just about right for the, the average size of the um, sort of family or group size coffee pots, again, that we were looking at in the Sears and Roebuck catalogs of the time. And here's a hearth uh, that's made out of limestone and caliche block, but there's one of those modified um, cans used as an individual stove uh, on the left-hand side, again, that may have been where they in particular were sitting a coffee pot. And then near one of the bread ovens, if you're gonna make a bunch of loaves of bread, you're gonna need some bread balls to put them in, especially while the dough is rising. And so here we have some cut off blasting powder cans nailed to some boards. And our interpretation is these are bread loaf pans used in conjunction uh, with those dome bronc ovens at this particular camp. And then other domestic uses, uh, the ubiquitous pail, uh, just by adding a bailing wire handle and also a water shower. It's hot, dusty work uh, where you take a can and you just puncture a bunch, a bunch of holes in the bottom of it. And then you can fill it with water and hang it up and stand underneath. So here's one of many pails we came across um, with, a, again, bailing wire. You're feeding the horses. Bailing wire would have been uh, routinely coming into the camp on those bales uh, and then reused for purposes such as, the, such as this. And then here's one of the showers uh, with some square uh, holes punched into it, probably using the back end of a rat tail file. Um, to just hammer a bunch of holes in the bottom of it to create a shower. And then we've got the mystery cans of unknown function. Um, again, these uh, we could tell were modified, but we weren't sure uh, exactly what they were used for, or maybe they weren't finished yet. Uh, here's a can with a circular pattern of knife slits. This may be created the dotted, dotted line to eventually cut out that center section. And maybe this is one of those uh, camp stoves, sort of the coffee, coffee can style camp stove uh, that was abandoned in progress, or maybe it's the beginning of a shower, or maybe it had its own individual use. We're just not sure. Uh, we had a lot of cans that had the ends cut out and the seam uh, cut and unrolled and flattened. Uh, these may have been used for uh, any number of adaptations uh, and we found several typically scattered around each of the camps. Again, out of context, so not sure exactly what functions they were serving. And so I think that pretty much gets us to the end of the presentation and I think mostly our hour so I'm going to stop sharing and let Samantha jump back in. Okay, you got a question toward the end. Uh, you mentioned Sears Robot catalog for canvas tent and forge purchases, but I recently read that you could buy an entire house through it as well. Yes. What is an important piece of America? America. So yeah, if if it was something that you could, you know, that you would expect to purchase, uh, Sears and Roebuck made a point of trying to make it available through their catalog. And so a lot of the craftsman style homes were standard pattern homes. And you could order a craftsman house through the Sears and Roebuck catalog and arrange delivery. Um, Part of the joist work would come pre-assembled. Uh, all of the lumber would come, some of it pre-cut, others would be certain lengths, and then there'd be instructions on where you needed to cut it for it to become window frames or door frames or flooring or whatever. And they would arrange delivery on a flat car, on a train to your nearest train stop, and you could show up with your wagon 
um, haul your home back to the homestead to nail it together yourself. So the Sears and Roebuck catalog of that time period, and a lot of them were illustrated with examples of the products. Uh, when we find bits and pieces broken at any given archeological site, it's always fun to try to match it up with a photo in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. So um, for the, the San Pedro, Los Angeles and Salt Lake, so today's Union Pacific, uh, they would do sidings every five miles. And so a siding is where you have a single track and you put in a spur and you put in a second or a third track, which will allow trains to pull off either to stop overnight or if it's a construction crew to do work, or if it's two trains traveling a single line that need to pass each other, one will get scheduled to arrive first and pull off on the siding We'll then wait for the other train to pass and then it'll pull back onto the main line. Um, so there was extra work required to lay the extra track at each of the sidings. So you'll get a main construction camp every five miles at each of the sidings. And then depending on how much cut and fill because of hills or washes, you might get smaller camps in between. Or if it was relatively flat, you may just have guys working from either side between main camps. Um, so the, the spacing also kind of tells you what kind of work was going on. If you were working at a main camp, at one of the sidings, or if you were looking at specific work in between, then you're probably near a wash or you're in a hilly area that required extra blasting. And that kind of helps you with the interpretation for the, the specific work that construction crew was doing. Yeah, that's cool. That's great to know. I really. And the only thing that I would like to do now is all of our sites were north of Souter Siding, which is where the two directions, because it was crews coming from Los Angeles, and there were crews coming from Salt Lake, and they met south of Las Vegas. We didn't go far enough south to get on the LA side of the construction. And the few reports that I've read from California where someone's recorded those cans, there's an ethnographic difference between construction crews. So there's a lot of Latin and Hispanic labor being drawn from the LA area that's coming up from the South. And they don't have any recorded bread ovens because that's a Mediterranean thing that we're seeing. But there's a lot of Ortega stamped uh, food cans that are likely chilies and jalapenos because they're the same size can we get in the grocery store today. Um, so it would be interesting to see what the material culture and the camps we recorded, how it is the same or different than the camps on the, the other end because of the different uh, ethnic mix of the construction crews. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Well, hopefully we we can figure that out like some hopefully other people have actually looked at those camps and and it's been a while since i've looked at the railroad archaeology literature because again this was 20 years ago when we were in the heat of these um so maybe someone has since then but it, it was always while we were doing it and looking at the newspapers because we'd also get reports of what's going on from the other end you know the 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 workers being talked about uh, we're, we're different from the two directions. So that was always one of the research questions is how close do we get to the siding where they joined it before we might see a mix? And we never saw a mix and we got pretty close to where that actual join point was. So. Cool. Oh, now we, we do have a question. So what was the significance of the San Pedro in SP, LA and Salt Lake line? So uh, there was no rail from Salt Lake to Los Angeles directly. And so uh, this was the attempt to get a Southern branch uh, uh, rail line from Salt Lake connecting Southern California. So San Pedro was the port, uh, Los Angeles was the, the major terminal city. So stuff would come off the boats at the port and then either transfer on the short track uh, or on the wagons to then a major end hub on this line for goods from the West Coast 
going up to Salt Lake and then stuff coming on the Transcontinental Railroad into Salt Lake City from back east, which otherwise would have split to the northwest, could then be diverted to the southwest and come from Salt Lake City back down to Los Angeles and all of us other smaller stops along the way. So 